The extremely powerful executive Sean Diddy Combs has had an ominous presence in the music industry for the past 30 years. From his suspicious involvement in the demise of Tupac and Biggie, his secretive ritualistic parties in the back rooms, as well as numerous accidental confessions has made the public pre-decide that he is guilty of all accusations against him. Not only have multiple women filed formal lawsuits alleging him of violent sexual assault and humiliation, but now the federal government raided his home as they investigate his involvement in a global sex trafficking operation. Technically at the moment he is not being charged of any crime, but any day now Diddy could feel the wrath of the American justice system. Today we are going to unearth the secrets he never wanted the world to know with the goal of determining one thing, did he do it or not? It's first very important to understand Diddy's potential involvement in the murders of Tupac and Biggie, because if you believe those allegations to be true, everything that happens afterwards makes total sense. In the mid-90s, Diddy, also known as Sean Puffy Combs, was in the middle of the infamous East Coast vs. West Coast hip-hop rivalry. It all began with East Coast rapper and Bad Boy Records signee, The Notorious B.I.G., versus his enemy, West Coast rapper and Death Row Records signee, Tupac Shakur. And it ended with both of them being assassinated via drive-by shootings. Biggie's murder remains unsolved to this day, but in 2023 we learned that Keefe D was the shot caller for the group of individuals that killed Tupac. Although we do not know the specific details as to why these two rap legends were killed, through all the theories, key information, and first-hand recollections from friends and witnesses of both murders indicate that Sean Combs had involvement in both murders. Biggie and Tupac were friendly and actually respected each other at first. Tupac had begun rapping in 1991 and within two years already had earned a platinum album. Biggie was a crack dealer who recorded freestyles for fun, until someone sent his tapes to Puffy who signed him to Bad Boy Records for $25,000. Puffy was also able to use his status in the music industry to connect Big and Pac. Pac became a mentor to Biggie. He once even asked him to be his manager. I was there, nigga. I trained the nigga. He used to be under me like my lieutenant. The nigga, I used to come to New York. I used to do shows and let the nigga come on before I did keep your head up and get around. Because mm -hmm. nobody knew the nigga in New York. Mm -hmm. And I used to tell the nigga, yo, if you hey, want to make your money, I'm, I'm, you got to rap for the bitches. Do not rap for the niggas. Yeah, I told yeah, the nigga, don't rap for the niggas. The rap for the bitches. The bitches will buy your records and the niggas want what the bitches want. So all of a sudden, he changed from being listen to party and bullshit, listen to his style. He changed from that to Big Pop. Pac believes that Biggie used him as a blueprint, changed his whole style, persona, and music to be more aligned with Tupac. Many people speculated that Diddy also had a slight obsession with Tupac. He started dripping himself in Versace after Tupac did it first. He also got romantically involved in women after Tupac had ran through them first. Like Sarah Chapman, who ran around with Tupac in the 90s and is now the mother of one of Diddy's children. Pac's claims aged like fine wine when recently the internet figured out that Biggie's most successful hit, Juicy, was actually stolen by a Mississippi-based artist called Notorious B1, who released a song called Big Daddy a year before Juicy that sounds exactly the same. Is it a coincidence that Notorious B1 and Notorious B.I.G. are very similar, and this song is called Big Daddy, and Biggie started going by Big Papa? But many people believe this was the mastermind of Diddy, as he was a music industry expert who knew how to scout talent and assess a hit song before anyone else heard it. They believe Puffy instructed his artist to steal from Notorious B1, and Biggie trusted his boss and mentor. Pac and Big's rivalry began as a music-based competition, who had more music sales, who had the better fashion, media representation, and cultural influence. But due to gangster rap creeping into the mainstream and the two being surrounded by legitimate gangsters, tensions escalated to life-threatening conflict. In November 1994, Tupac was on his way to record some music at Quad Studios in New York City. Coincidentally, Biggie was there recording with Junior Mafia, which was a group of four friends that Big knew since their childhood. Puffy was there too since Big was his artist and anything that Big writes or records is technically owned by the Bad Boy label. Allegedly, a man by the name of Jimmy Henchman, who is now serving life in prison, was planning a robbery on Tupac since Pac owed him some money. Many speculate that Jimmy told Puffy what was about to happen, but Puffy did not try to stop it. When Pac was outside the studio, he looked up and realized rapper Lil Cease, who is best friends with Biggie, was yelling at him from above. He was excited to see him, because they were friends. He told him he was going to go downstairs and meet him in the lobby. Pac got to the lobby downstairs when some men attempted to rob him at 
gunpoint, which quickly led to conflict and Pak being shot five times. In the middle of that trial, Shakur was gunned down, shot five times in what he claimed was a murder attempt and police called a robbery. As the police did their investigation, you can see Diddy looking around scanning the area with his head down. Keep in mind that after Tupac was shot, he got in the elevator and went upstairs where dozens of bad boy affiliates were located. Pac was interviewed by Vibe magazine detailing the night he was shot and the energy of the people around him while he was bleeding out. Because Andre Harrell was there, Puffy was there, Biggie, nobody approached me. I noticed that nobody would look at me. Andre Harrell wouldn't look at me. I had been going to dinner with him the last few days. Puffy was standing back too. I knew Puffy. He knew how much stuff I had done for Biggie before he came out. Based on Tupac's words here, fans in the media believe that he was hinting that Biggie and Puffy might be behind the attack, which bothered Big and Puff since publicly at this point they were still friends. Tupac article had me pissed off, you know what I'm saying? And the rumors that spread is on some tip like we set him up, you know what I'm saying? And that's crazy. It's just ridiculous, you know what I'm saying? But I also understand that if you was to get shot five times, the mind is just completely spinning, you know what I'm saying? You're real confused about your situation. So it'll cause you to say things that you really don't mean. To make things worse, a few months later, Pac was found guilty of sexual assault and would end up serving nine months in prison. This gave him tons of time to think and reevaluate his life. To add insult to injury, Biggie released his iconic cutthroat track called Who Shot Ya, which felt like an obvious diss towards Tupac. But technically, it was recorded before Pac got shot, but it was marketed and released months after the incident. Regardless, the media developed the narrative that Big and Puffy set up the shooting and now released a diss record bragging about their hit. And Puff Puff's full intentions were to stir up drama, as can be confirmed by the former president of Bad Boy Records. Biggie might not have thought that when he wrote the lyrics that it was going to be used for that, but the way it was marketed by the company and released in the succession of things that were going on that we were dealing with on all the levels that we were dealing, that record did what it was supposed to do. And that's a perfect example of how my former business partner works and thinks. Pac was sitting in jail already thinking that they set him up, and the release of this song was all the proof he needed. But this wasn't the only shooting that Puffy was involved in. It's also important to know that Tupac signed to Death Row Records while in prison after the label owner Suge Knight promised to use his money to get Pac released. As they were in the process of getting Pac out, Suge Knight and his best friend Jake Robles, aka Big Jake, were at the Platinum Nightclub in Atlanta. Suge confronted Puffy at the club and was choking him. Puffy's bodyguard, Anthony Wolf Jones steps in to defend him and then things got out of hand. Next thing you know, shots are being fired and Suge's friend Big Jake was shot and killed. Whether or not Wolf shot Jake has never been confirmed, but Suge was holding Puffy responsible for the attack, which was enough to now ignite a feud between the two executives. Quick sidebar, recently fans have noticed that Puffy's firstborn biological son Justin Combs looks a lot like Wolf. How does your son look more like your best friend than you? Anyways, in October 1995, Tupac got out of prison and he wanted war. I have no fear. I have only ambition and I want mine and I will do anything to protect and feed my family. And these niggas represent a threat. Pac got out and immediately started taunting and scheming on Bad Boy Records as much as possible. In the days after his release from prison, he jumped into the studio to record his next album, All Eyes On Me, and he talked about the anticipated tracks. Two of America's Most Wanted with me and Snoop. That's gonna be a home thing, right? Sure they wanna be a thug. That's gonna be a big one. Uh -huh. And um, wonder why they call you bitch with Faith. That's gonna be a big one. He mentions Faith, aka Faith Evans, who was married to Biggie for over a year at this point. Imagine your wife jumps in the studio with your biggest enemy one week after he gets out of jail. Pac was also seen with Faith Evans at Whitney Houston's album release party. The rumor is that Biggie cheated on Faith and that she was trying to get back at him by cheating with Pac. Pac also allegedly started messing around with Mary J. Blige, who was a close friend and business partner with Puffy. Then Death Row Records held a Christmas party in 1995 where a close friend of Puffy, Mark Anthony Bell, was was mercilessly beaten and forced to drink urine after refusing to give Suge Puffy's mother's address. Tupac and Death Row did not let off the gas. At the 1996 Soul Train Awards, Biggie won the award for Song of the Year, and Tupac won Best Rap Album of the Year. After Big got his award, he took some pictures backstage and then exited the venue because he had to go to the airport to catch a flight. And that's when Pac and Suge pulled up in a Hummer, taunting them. While we was waiting for the car to pull up, Suge and Tupac pulled up in the Hummer. And, uh, you know, Tupac was really loud, yelling West Side, you know, cursing, yelling a bunch of stuff. And Suge came from the other side and was like trying to actually walk up to us saying, he just want to talk to Big. Like, 
want to talk, but of course everybody got in front. You know, it's a little yelling and arguing for a minute, but police and everybody got in front, kind of stopped everything. Despite Biggie's gangster lyrics, he was really a chill dude who didn't want to beef with Pac. Remember, he looked up to him. He always thought they were friends, but as we are speculating, he seemed to be a pawn in a much bigger operation. He knows you sent somebody to shoot him that first time. Why? Is that true or false? Why? No, it's false. Why okay. would I do that? Okay. Do you think he was just hyping a record or just, or you have no idea? I just, I don't know what was the problem. You know, I wasn't inside his head at the time. I don't really know what's the reason for him doing what he did. Tupac was a man on fire. A man who he believes was wrongfully convicted of a crime he didn't commit, was constantly being slandered by the media, and now feels was being disrespected by his biggest enemies, on top of being surrounded by real gangsters. He released a music video alongside Snoop Dogg called Two of America's Most Wanted, which featured a skit mocking Biggie and Puff. Pop, please don't kill me. It was Buff's idea. Oh, man, I'm just a rapper, man. Out. Please don't take me out the gal. <laughs> Interesting that Tupac himself instructed the Biggie actor in the 90s to say it was Puff's idea, as if he knew the truth. Then Pac released one of the most abrasive and iconic diss tracks of all time, Hit Him Up. He starts off the song claiming he had sex with Biggie's wife and then directly calls Biggie, Puffy, and Junior Mafia all bitches along with various other threats. The pressure was on Bad Boy. Pac was not going to stop, and Puffy couldn't take the heat. Biggie's bodyguard, Gene Deal, recalls when Puff reached his tipping point. He said, I'm a businessman. I'm about making money, but something gotta change. I don't give a f if Pac gotta die, Big gotta die, or Suge Knight go to jail. Something's gotta change. Gene was taken back. He wondered if Puff realized that he just said he didn't care if his own artist died. At the same time, he still wanted to play gangster games. As we all know, these gangster games only lead to two outcomes death or jail, and Tupac would meet his fate on September 13th, 1996. Pac and the Death Row Squad were attending the Bruce Seldon vs. Mike Tyson boxing match in Las Vegas. Hyped up from the testosterone and the energy of the fight, Pac wanted some action. A Death Row associate pointed out Orlando Anderson to Pac, who was a Southside Crip gang member, a rival to the Pyru blood set that was affiliated with Death Row Records. Pac went up to Orlando and punched him in the face. Then Death Row associates put a beating on the man. Later that night, Suge and Tupac were driving down East Flamingo Road to Club 662, when suddenly a white Cadillac pulled up beside them at a red light and opened fire on Tupac. He was hit four times, with the fatal shot piercing his lung. Just last year, Las Vegas police arrested a man called Dwayne Keefe D. Davis, who was a shot caller for the group of individuals that committed this crime, and he orchestrated the plan that was carried out. Ironically, Keefe D. has been confessing his involvement publicly on the internet for years. In 2008, he confessed that his nephew, Orlando Anderson, the man that Tupac punched earlier that night, was the one who actually pulled the trigger. KVD has now identified his own nephew as the murderer of Tupac Shakur. Bolstering KVD's claim was an informant in 1997 who told investigators that Puffy had hired the Southside Crips to kill both Suge and Tupac, and that the Crip who has jumped at the MGM was in the group that had done the hit. This was exactly the same story that Keefe D told us a decade later. Keefe also stated that Puffy offered them one million dollars to kill Suge and Tupac. We, we wanted a million. Yeah, he said, come on down here and talk to you. He tells you, seriously, man, I need to get rid of these guys. I mean, he's looking at you in the eyes and yeah. he's like scared. Yeah. You tell him, we'll do it for a million. And he's like, okay, I'll do it for a million. Yeah. He agrees, you shake yeah. on him or something yeah. like that. Nothing. Who brought up the amount of one million dollars? He did. Puffy did? Yeah. Okay. Was it you? No, it wasn't me. I'll shit. A million dollars out there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> when Diddy was asked about this confession, this was his response. It was this documentary that claimed, which we know wasn't true. Yeah, yeah, check this out. We don't, we don't talk about things that are nonsense. We don't even entertain nonsense, my brother. So we not even gonna even go there with all due respect, but I appreciate you as a journalist asking. Thank you. As you can imagine, Death Row was likely seeking retaliation for the murder of Tupac. Everyone at Bad Boy Records knew they were not safe, but they were especially not safe in Southern California. An LA kingpin called Gene Deal, Diddy's bodyguard, and warned him that there was a hit placed on Biggie in LA. This somebody did 26 years in the federal jail as a kingpin, brother. He called me to save Biggs them life. Tell them niggas not to go nowhere. It's a hit on them. You get this information from a kingpin, brother. Chas Williams. 
Despite knowing all this information, in February of 1997 they headed out to Los Angeles to promote Biggie's new album, Life After Death. Puffy also wanted to record some of his album, No Way Out, in LA. Lil Cease, Biggie's best friend, claims that Big wanted to be in LA. If he say go, we going. If he stay, we staying. Big wanted to stay. I always tell people that, yo, why, everybody always go, why, why y'all was there so long, or why you didn't tell him to go home? He's the boss. <laughs> We're here because of him. And if he feel like it's no threat and he wants to be here, it's our job to stand down with him. Biggie was not taunting the West Coast. He genuinely loved being in LA. He received a lot of love from fans, promoters, radio DJs, despite being surrounded by his enemies. Instead of claiming to be the victor of his beef with Tupac, Biggie wanted to use his life to inspire change and squash the East Coast vs West Coast beef. The truth is, over the years, Puffy and Biggie had made so many enemies that they didn't really know who was after them. But they overstayed their welcome in the City of Angels, and Big's demise came on March 9th, 1997. After presenting an award at the 1997 Soul Train Awards, the Bad Boy crew attended the after party hosted by Vibe Magazine at the Peterson Automotive Museum. Biggie left the party riding in the front passenger seat of a Chevrolet Suburban SUV with Puffy and other Entourage members driving directly in front of them. As they stopped at the first red light, a dark colored Chevrolet Impala pulled up alongside Biggie's SUV. An unknown assailant inside the Impala rolled down the window and fired multiple shots at Biggie's vehicle. Biggie was hit numerous times by gunfire fire, sustaining four gunshot wounds. One of the bullets struck him in the chest, causing severe internal injuries. He was immediately rushed to the Cedar sinai Medical Center, but pronounced dead at the hospital that night. So what happened? Well, Puffy's business partner said that they had used up all their budget on security, so they couldn't hire extra security for this evening. Keithy D was also at this party and offered protection. Puff told him to stand down. Puff decided to ride in the separate car located in front of Biggie's. Then he gave his security guard, Gene Deal, very strange instructions rather than maximizing Big's protection. I tried to ride on the side of the car. Puff said, yo, Gene, what you doing? I said, I'm riding on the side of the car. I'm having my gun out. So he says to me, Gene, if you don't get in this car, you ain't gonna never work for bad boy ever again. I said, man, how the f you gonna try to tell me how to do my job? He said, Gene, we don't need that look. We don't need that look. Get in the car. As I go to get in the car, this motherfucker reached down and let his seat all the way back. So now I gotta put my leg sideways. I'm like, yo, what the fuck is you doing? I said, you ready? He said, you ready. I said, Kenny, run the next three lights. Kenny said, for what? I said, motherfucker, run the next three lights, Kenny, or I'm gonna drive. Kenny just took off. The first car ran the red lights, but the car behind them did not follow. They decided to stop at the red light. Lil C's had his head hanging out the window trying to holler at some girls. Then out of nowhere, the shooting took place. According to an FBI agent, Phil Carson, who worked on the case for several years, Suge Knight hired Amir Muhammad to carry out the execution. However, the agent says that the original target was not Biggie. They were targeting Sean Puffy Combs. Gene also believes this story is the truth. I believe it was meant for Puff. The people that tried to kill Puff that night, for whatever reason, because we had some beef with some Muslim cats in Soul Train too. For whatever reason, the people that was trying to kill Puff, Big became a casualty of Puff shit. When they rushed Big to the hospital, Lil Cease, who literally looked the shooter right in his face, gave a description to Gene. This is what he said. Lil Cease at the hospital, he said a Muslim shot Big. And I said to Paul, with the blue suit, white shirt, blue bow tie, he said, Gene, how you know? I said, that motherfucker walked up to Puff car first. Lil Cease's description of the man matches up to what the FBI uncovered. All in all, to say that Puffy set up the murders of Pac and Biggie is not exactly accurate, but the origins of the beef and the escalation of the beef can most definitely be traced back to Puffy. Also, he definitely knew that danger was looming for Pac and Biggie and did not even come close to trying to prevent both of their deaths. Because at the end of the day, Puff was the one who benefited most from them dying. Think about it from the perspective of Puffy the businessman. Tupac dies, that makes Biggie the winner. Biggie looks like the ultimate gangster who warned his enemy with a diss track and then got him killed. That helps feed into the persona and sell more records. Plus, with Tupac dead, there is no more competition. Biggie's inspiration, his idol, the dude who he copied everything from can no longer defend himself from the grave. Now, we know that Puff didn't exactly want Big to die, but he wasn't doing everything in his power to protect him. Additionally, Puff saw how much money Death Row was making after Tupac passed. Tupac Shakur sold 67,000 records in the week following his 
murder. Two months after he died, they released The Don Caluminati, The Seven Day Theory, which Shakur recorded under the name Machiavelli. It debuted at number one on the Billboard Hot 200 with first week sales of 664,000 and 250,000 the second week. To this day, Tupac has sold 75 million records, most of which came posthumously. Puffy owned all of Big's publishing. He allegedly purchased it from him for $200,000 years before he passed, which meant that everything he recorded or wrote for himself or other artists, Puff owned all of Biggie's percentage. Aside from the tens of millions of dollars in albums Big sold posthumously, he was also a prolific songwriter. He wrote all of Junior Mafia's album. He wrote for Lil' Kim. He wrote for Mace, Craig Mack. Also consider every single time he's been sampled over the years. Diddy has been making money off Biggie for more years than Biggie was alive. There were even suspicions that Biggie was aware of how much control Puffy had over his music and tried to sign over all his new music to his infant daughter, but passed away before he could get the business deals done. Biggie's mother, Valletta Wallace, has repeatedly expressed her distrust of Diddy. The truth is, Christopher accepted the illusion of a friend and mentor for about $25,000. That's the amount Puffy lured my son with. That was a lot of money for Christopher back then as a 19-year-old. She continued by saying that she was glad her son does not have to witness that the very people that he thought he could ride and die with wouldn't think twice about using his mother. She added, I am glad that he is not here to see how they have used his image and his name. Diddy was filthy rich, extremely powerful, and evidently unpredictable. Imagine how easy it was to leverage his power in the music industry and his personal life. If you said no to him, in theory, he could blackball you, extort you, or maybe something more permanent. So consider that when we begin analyzing his history of suspicious behavior. I got my MTV out. Savage! I'm a savage! Oh! I'm a savage! Whatever I want, I'm going to get! Whatever I want, I have to get! Let's start with the mysterious Puffy's Flavor Camp, where Diddy would mentor teenage musicians, like Usher, and give them a taste of the music industry. R&B sensation Usher was nothing short of a child prodigy. By age 13, he had already been discovered in Atlanta by L.A. Reid, and they sent him to New York City to record his debut album with Diddy. In 1994, Usher was just 14 years old, and he moved into Diddy's house to be a part of his Flavor Camp. I Come mean, on. but did I, hey, it was curious. I got a chance to see some things. Yeah, but you were 13. What were you I seeing? I went there to see the lifestyle. Right. And, and I saw it. And it was, <laughs> and it was, but I don't know if I could indulge and understand what I was even looking at. It was, it was pretty wild. It was, so nobody it was tried to, you know, some woman didn't come along. I didn't say that. Okay. I, I didn't but say that. <laughs> what I did say is that there were very curious things taking place. Uh huh. And I didn't necessarily understand it. Uh. Usher has been very reluctant to discuss what happened when he lived with Diddy. In a 2004 article with Rolling Stone, he said, Puff introduced me to a totally different set of shit. Sex, specifically. Sex is so hot in the industry, man. While he was in New York, he lived at Puffy's house in Scarsdale. There was always girls around. You'd open a door and see somebody doing it, or several people in a room having an orgy. You never knew what was going to happen. Some people look at this as nothing short of grooming a young boy. One time, Diddy himself detailed what living with Usher was like. Back in the days when he was like 10 and I was a little bit older, his older brother, we used to fight over the, over the Frosted Flakes, you know what I'm saying, before paws was invented. <laughs> but it's my brother for real. We used to actually wrestle off of the off of the frosted place because he used to always get up early. Yo, what the f did Puff just say? Even though Kevin Hart was just joking, he really was the only one that seemed to question what Diddy was talking about. But Usher looks kind of uncomfortable. And you'll notice a theme where Diddy is very comfortable touching other people, embracing them, calling them pet names, and almost always the other person's body language screams they do not like it. Man, you doing it, man. You deserve it, daddy. You putting in that work. But Usher is not the only artist in the industry who may have been a victim of Puffy's flavor camp. Justin Bieber was also mentored by Diddy early on in his career. Bieber, just after his 15th birthday, spent 48 hours with Diddy. Diddy gifted him a Lamborghini Gallardo and let the world know why him and the teenager were hanging out. Where we hanging out and what we doing, um, we, we can't really disclose, but um, it's definitely a 15 year old's dream. I don't really, I don't have legal guardianship of him, but for the next 48 hours, he's with me. So, um, and, yeah, and we're we gonna go full, buck full crazy. 
Combs seems to be acting strange, but Justin seems alright. At the time, he was still a young star, glamorized by the industry. One year later, his demeanor towards Diddy was much different. What's up, man? You good? I'm good. How are you? All right, young brother, everything's good? Everything's Selling great. out arenas and everything? Yeah. Starting to act different, huh? No, you, no, ain't, no. you ain't been calling me and hanging out the way we used to hang out. Well, I mean, you haven't... I mean, you try to get in contact with me, you know, through all my, you know, biz, you know, partners and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But it, you, you never really got, got my number, so. Now, Combs is renowned for hosting lavish and star-studded parties that have become legendary in the entertainment industry. Diddy parties are famous for attracting A-list celebrities across all industries. I had the craziest mix, Combs told Oprah. Some of my boys from Harlem, Leonardo DiCaprio after he'd just finished Titanic, I had socialites there, and relatives from down south. Diddy parties are typically hosted at luxury venues or his own private residences. The media were quick to anoint him the modern-day Gatsby, a title he embraced with open arms. Have I read The Great Gatsby, he said to a reporter in 2001? I am The Great Gatsby. However, many people forget that one of Diddy's first parties ever resulted in the deaths of nine attendees. In 1991, 22-year-old Sean Combs was the promoter of the Heavy D's and Puff Daddy celebrity charity basketball game at City College's Nat Holman Gymnasium, the infamous Puffy Party where a stampede occurred taking the lives of nine people. Some of the hottest rappers in the game were set to attend, Boys to Men, Fife Dog, Big Daddy Kane, Jodeci, even LL Cool J and Mike Tyson showed up. The crazy part is that fans could see all of their favorite stars for just $12. The first problem occurred with the tickets. Keep in mind, this is in 91, so people had to go to physical locations like the Apollo Theater box office to buy tickets. Tickets were also sold at local shops like Boss Emporium, and even free tickets were given out on the radio by Funkmaster Flex. The facility could only hold 2,730 people, but they had no idea how many tickets they sold, as no proper system was set in place to keep track. Despite this, Gene Deal recalls Puffy requesting to cut security presence in half. Uh, this particular day, uh, Puff calls me the day be the day before we supposed to do the party and say, yo, Gene, I don't need y'all to do the security outside. I got the FOIs to do it. So I said, man, I just told 18 guys. He said, I just need eight. I just need eight. To clarify, the FOIs are Fruit of Islam members. One witness to the event said, you cannot have an event like this in Harlem without those Muslims, said Oscar Davis, 32, of the Bronx. Forget the police. They can't do nothing. The people in Harlem respect the Muslims. It was blatantly obvious that more people were outside than could actually fit in the gym. Despite the overcrowding, tickets were still being sold at the door, said Mario Salvaggi, a city police police patrol chief. Fans entered through two side exits and funneled down the stairs, through the doors, into the gymnasium. But once LL Cool J and Mike Tyson showed up, all hell broke loose. Mobs of people started swarming from outside to rush inside, pushing people forward towards the glass doors. The glass doors eventually were shut and needed to be pulled towards the crowd to be opened. Guards tried to instruct people to fall back, but they wouldn't listen. The pressure became so great that the glass doors shattered and people fell through them. Outsiders began stampeding and stomping over bodies to get inside the facility, but the problem just got worse as they needed to go down the stairs into the gym. The doors at the bottom of the stairs also needed to be pulled open towards the crowd, not pushed into the gym. So hundreds of people were squeezed up against these doors in this tiny stairwell with no way to escape. Also notice that these doors don't have any windows. So inside of the gym, people were having a great time. From the outside, you can hear them partying, playing music, and rappers shouting over the microphone. They didn't even know that just on the other side of those doors, were people fighting for their lives. Eventually, they got the doors open. As much as six people were stacked on top of each other and began spilling onto the gym floor, finally relieving the pressure. People began trying to perform CPR on the ground. Someone announced over the microphone that three people died right there. This caused chaos, and the people inside the gym began trying to leave, stampeding back through the exact same stairwell where people were trapped in the first place. Police identified five men and three women dead at the scene, and 29 people were injured. A ninth victim died in the hospital days later. All of them died from asphyxiation. Eight families of the deceased settled wrongful death lawsuits against Mr. Combs in early 1998. Mr. Combs ended up paying around 600000 of a total $3 million or so. Now, clearly, this wasn't all Diddy's fault. Legally, the courts claim the city 50% responsible and the promoters 50% responsible. Regardless, death and dark energy seemed to lure around Diddy since his earliest days. From there, he kind of stopped 
throwing parties for the public and started to keep them private. However, over the years, disturbing rumors have spread regarding what happens during Diddy's parties, ranging from group sex rituals to casting couches where newcomers would secure their future in various industries. The biggest rumor is that aspiring male talent would need to pleasure other powerful men to advance their careers, and apparently it's an open secret in the music industry, which is why Shannon Sharp erupted in laughter when Cat Williams said, because uh, P. Diddy be wanting a body. And you gotta tell him no. Oh, you Lord. got to tell him no. I, I did. I did. Now, Diddy has six biological children with three different women. He has had multiple high profile relationships with the likes of Jennifer Lopez, Naomi Campbell, and Cassie. But you will notice that most of the party stories that circulate involve him being surrounded by men. Josh Ostrovsky, who goes by The Fat Jewish on social media, detailed his strange experience at a Diddy party. I'm on ecstasy and I'm trying to find the bathroom. Mm -hmm. and I can't find the bathroom and I get lost. So I open a door and in the that room there are a bunch of men laying about and you know kind of like very like kind of leaning on each other not, like if you were spooning but facing each other and like leaning up on your elbow and like, talking like it would know. almost be the prelude to an orgy yes oh absolutely okay. oh, oh my god oh okay. my god it was so prelude okay. to an orgy and who is lounging in my direct eye line puff daddy and Felix the house cat, famed house music producer, yeah, no, I know are know that is. basically spooning each other. And they're drinking a glass of Hennessy. And they're like sharing. They're like passing it back and forth. And everyone's talking. And everyone's just like talking. Yeah. And then as soon as I see them, I'm like... All men though. There's not one men, woman in this room. All men. And yeah. they're all 100% they're all on ecstasy. Shortly after Josh and Diddy locked eyes, he was kicked out. Josh, who is a gay man, immediately felt like he was in a room full of other gay men. But there was no real accusation nor damning evidence here. It could have just been a group of guys chilling. So let's take a listen to rapper Exhibit recounting his experience partying with Diddy. Florida, we got invited to a, a Puffy party, a New Year's Eve party. Uh -huh. uh, he, he invited us to the house because he wanted to go to the club after. Puffy calls me outside. He's like, hey, man, that, that girl you, you know about. He's like, uh, you know, that's the devil, man. You know what I'm saying? I was like, what you mean that's the devil? Mm -hmm. So we get into the truck. He said, let's go to this club. You know, we sitting there bobbing to the music. And then he said, she pointed over the corner. It's two dudes kissing. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, the f this and then she pointed another direction it's another dude over there like butt ass naked dancing. Well, I've been. you know what I'm saying <laughs> <laughs> we take off, man. You're Based on X's story, it seems like Diddy brought him to a gay club. Or maybe coincidentally, Exhibit just looked at the only two gay couples in a regular club. 50 Cent also recalls one of the first times he met Diddy. We gotta, we gotta kick that. it. This is Puff. Okay. He's telling me we gotta kick it and shit. And he's like, yo, why don't we like go shopping or some shit? I mean, like, I pay for it. And I was like, what the f this nigga just said? <laughs> 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 it's a fruit pile. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a fruit pile. Trust me. Now there is no doubt that homophobia has been prevalent in hip hop forever. However, some people are just simply not gay and Diddy's actions make them feel uncomfortable. Like rappers Fabulous and Jadakiss who were pressed by Diddy on a podcast that got really awkward really quickly. He began by repeatedly calling the host Nori, Daddy. Mr. Lee, we're, yeah, I love this drink. Will you put my bag? I like yeah. when you like this, Daddy. Yeah, yeah, will you put my bag? Daddy, I like Mr. when you oh, when you're right scrambling here, right here. and scraping for no, 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 shit. No, 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 I, got I no like that. Shit. You know, I'll be practicing. Then he proceeded to ask Fabulous why he didn't want to party with him. See where I look, Did you look miss back me? on where I became. Mm. Did you miss me though? Mm. For real, because we. I'm saying I miss, it seems like a thing. I miss his birthday with party, Puff, man. Man, I miss but I'm talking about for your birthday. Huh? Why won't you party with me for your birthday, man? I, I, we we party for my birthday before. You came to my party. You know? No, but me and you ain't never really party. You know what I'm saying? Jadakiss kept his head looking straight down for almost the entire interview, and you could tell Fabulous was very uneasy about Diddy's presence. When Diddy was confronted about it, this was his response. Oh, right scrambling right and scraping for no, 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 shit. No, no, no. That was you. Scrambling. <laughs> you said, you said, what? You said, I like when you do it like that, daddy. When you're scrambling and scraping for shit. Hey, man. <laughs> nah, nah, I mean, I was You don't cold. go back no, and no, look no. at that stuff and laugh? I mean, it's, I mean, it, it could be funny. I don't really be on it like that. Yeah. It seems like he genuinely has no idea why people thought what he said was weird. He says things, he doesn't even know what he's saying is like fruity. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, he said something fabulous and he goes, yo, no, we, no, but me and you, we ain't party. Like, we need to party. 
<laughs> what are you talking about? Yo, yo. What is he talking about? Uh, <laughs> no, that's the kind going of stuff. When people say that to me, I get a little comfortable. <laughs> but even with all the jokes, rumors, and secrets, nobody ever formally spoke out against Diddy and accused him of assault or abuse until 2019, when his ex-girlfriend Gina Huynh spoke publicly about what it's like to be in a relationship with him. Keep in mind that Gina was a side girlfriend for Diddy. The public didn't know about her because his public relationship was with Cassie Ventura, who he had been on and off dating for a decade. He had caught me texting another man. We were in his closet and he like pushed me and I fell to the ground. He like stood over me. He avoided my face, but he like started punching me like on the side of the, my head and I was just like covering my face. He like stomped on my stomach, like took the wind out of my breath. I couldn't even, I couldn't breathe, pleading to him like, can you, can you stop? And he like, stopped for a little bit he like grabbed my hair from the back and like was um like punching the back of my head she also claims that she was pregnant with his child in 2014. Uh, you mind telling me what happened with that pregnancy he was like you're gonna get an abortion right i was like i don't know yet and then he offered me fifty thousand to get rid of it but i turned it down because i just I just loved him. Gina did not take the money, but she also did not have the child. Four years later, she got pregnant again. Gina goes on to detail multiple other instances of emotional and physical abuse, but she never filed any formal charges. It wasn't all the way until November of 2023 that someone finally filed a formal lawsuit against Diddy. After that, the floodgates were opened, and Sean Combs' dark past crept out of the shadows. In the lawsuit, Cassie Ventura, his longtime girlfriend, accused Mr. Combs of and of repeated physical abuse over about a decade. As you can imagine, this lawsuit and these allegations went extremely viral. After all these years of shady rumors, weird behavior, and dark secrets, the entire world was prepared for Diddy's decline. Ventura and Combs met in 2005 when she was 19 and he was 37. He heard a song she was marketing called Me and You. He then contacted Ryan Leslie, who wrote Cassie's first single, and paired Bad Boy Records with Leslie's next selection imprint for the release of Cassie's debut album. In August 2006, Cassie released her self-titled album under Bad Boy Records. The pair formed a close relationship through working together for several months as Cassie became the face of Diddy's fashion label, Sean John. In 2007, Diddy separated from his longtime partner partner Kim Porter and started dating Cassie. Cassie alleged that Combs controlled nearly every aspect of her life, from her career to having access to her personal medical records. She claims he was frequently violent, physically abusing her multiple times a year, and that he often plied her with copious amounts of drugs, which made videos like this one seem awfully suspicious, where Cassie seems to be hiding from Diddy. What? What you gotta say now? What you gotta say now? You ain't got shit to say when you put your girl on the snap. Baby, yo, baby. I mean, shit getting weird. Come on, baby, it's hot outside. You fucking wrapped up in that blanket. Let's go jog on the beach. The court papers assert that others who worked with Mr. Combs helped him control Miss Ventura, like suppressing her music if she did not obey his orders, or by helping to conceal his behavior. But it wasn't just mentally controlling. He also often got physically violent with her. In one incident in Los Angeles in 2009, the suit says that Mr. Combs became enraged when he saw Miss Ventura talking to another talent agent, then pushed her into a car and kicked her repeatedly in the face, making her bleed. The suit also details Diddy's request for Cassie to engage in his newest sexual fantasy called voyeurism. Combs forced Ventura to have sex with male sex workers in different cities, encounters she claimed he watched, pleasured himself to, and recorded. This is the allegation that likely opened up a federal investigation into him sex trafficking people. According to the suit, Mr. Combs called these encounters freak-offs, which involved costumes, like masquerade masks and lingerie. The lawsuit continues to detail some of the most horrific, embarrassing, and torturous behavior Diddy allegedly committed. Combs' lawyer, Benjamin Braffman, responded to the lawsuit on behalf of him. Mr. Combs vehemently denies these offensive and outrageous allegations. For the past six months, Mr. Combs has been subjected to Miss Ventura's persistent demand of $30 million, under the threat of writing a damaging book about their relationship. Despite them denying everything, the lawsuit was settled just 24 hours after it was made public. We don't know how much, 
but due to the severity of the charges, the public assumed that Diddy coughed up tens of millions of dollars to keep her quiet. And while Combs likely believed that he escaped Cassie's lawsuit unscathed, a woman named Liza Gardner filed a lawsuit on November 23rd. Gardner claimed that she and a friend met Combs and singer-songwriter Aaron Hall at an MCA Records event in either 1990 or 1992. They returned to Hall's apartment for an after-party where she was offered more drinks and was coerced into having sex with Combs, who assaulted both her and her friend. In another complaint filed the same day, Joy Dickerson Neal alleged that in 1991, she reluctantly went on a date with Combs, who intentionally drugged and sexually assaulted her after their dinner. Diddy denied the allegations through a spokesperson who claimed that the women's claims were fabricated and accused them of exploiting the Adult Survivors Act. The New York's Adult Survivors Act temporarily eliminated the civil statute of limitations for survivors of sexual assault, which gave them the right to file a lawsuit against the perpetrator regardless of how long ago it occurred. Then another woman came out. Jane Doe alleged that Combs, his longtime lieutenant, Harv Pierre, and a third unidentified assailant gang her when she was 17 at Combs Manhattan Recording Studio in 2003. Pierre, who previously served as president of Combs Bad Boy Entertainment, had also been sued by a former assistant, who alleges he used his position of authority as plaintiff's boss to groom, exploit, and sexually assault her several times between 2016 and 2017. The lawsuit further claimed that men trafficked Doe across state lines from Detroit to New York City on a private jet, supplied the teenager with drugs and alcohol until she couldn't consent, and then violently assaulted her. The complaint also included several photos that Doe alleges were taken at the studio that night, including one where she is sitting on Combs' lap. Enough is enough, Diddy said on Instagram. For the last couple of weeks, I have sat silently and watched people try to assassinate my character, destroy my reputation and my legacy. I did not do any of the awful things being alleged. I will fight for my name, my family, and for the truth. But it wasn't just women accusing him. In February of 2024, Combs' former producer and videographer, Rodney Lil Rod Jones, filed a federal lawsuit against Combs, alleging Combs sexually harassed, drugged, and threatened him. According to the lawsuit, Rodney Lil Rod Jones lived with Combs between September 2020 and November 2023, during which he worked on Diddy's most recent album, The Love Album, Off the Grid. As Combs' videographer, Jones allegedly secured hours of footage and audio recordings of Combs engaging in illegal activity. The activity the suit alleges includes acquiring drugs, soliciting sex workers, providing laced drinks to minors, and sexual assault. Jones alleges that he was the victim of constant unsolicited and unauthorized groping and touching of his anus by Mr. Combs. Mr. Jones was forced by Mr. Combs to work in Mr. Combs' bathroom as Mr. Combs walked around naked and showered in a clear glass enclosure. In the lawsuit, Jones also alleges that Young Miami, who is Diddy's most recent girlfriend, was among those who were paid a monthly fee by Diddy to work as his sex workers. Jones believed Diddy was grooming him with the goal of passing him off to others. While on a yacht in January of 2023, Jones alleges he was introduced to Oscar-winning actor Cuba Gooding Jr., who proceeded to grope and fondle him until being forcibly pushed away. Jones claimed that Diddy, who had dominion and control over Gooding Jr., failed to step in. Also in Jones's lawsuit, an unnamed rapper is mentioned as having been on Diddy's yacht, where they were allegedly seen consorting with underage girls and sex workers. This rapper is described as a Philadelphia rapper who dated Nicki Minaj. Rapper Meek Mill is from Philadelphia and dated Nicki Minaj from 2014 to 2016. That same unnamed rapper, also an unnamed R&B singer, and producer Stevie J alleged allegedly engaged in sexual intercourse with Diddy. This allegation has people looking at that clip of Meek Mill in the pool with Diddy calling him daddy more suspiciously. Also, 50 Cent made some jokes about Diddy and Stevie J on Instagram, to which Stevie J responded with not denying the allegations, but challenging 50 Cent to a boxing match. How we go? I want you to fade, nigga. Fuck all that. Since it's entertainment, let me beat the shit out of you on TV or something. Don't duck that. I'm calling you out. What you want to do, Curtis? But the most shocking allegation made in the lawsuit was Mr. Jones discovered that Mr. Combs has hidden cameras in every room of his homes, and that Diddy was secretly recording artists and powerful executives, like Lucy and Grange who was mentioned in the lawsuit, who may or may not have participated in the freak-offs. If this turns out to be true, we might see some of the most powerful people in the entertainment industry get exposed, and 50 Cent wants to be a part of the expose. He said on Instagram, shaking my head, this is gonna be so good. What you wanna bet I'm gonna get the 
these tapes. I'll pay top dollar for them. You been over there? I don't go to Puffy's parties. However, it seems as though Sean Combs' reign of terror may be over. On March 25th, 2024, Homeland Security agents and other law enforcement officers raided Diddy's homes in Los Angeles and Miami due to a possible ongoing sex trafficking investigation. Homeland Security expert Hal Kempfer added some insight that the evidence they're looking for includes laptops, flash drives, and anything that would connect Combs with the allegations. As of right now, we don't know what they found and technically the feds never formally announced what they were looking for or why they were there. But it's safe to assume, based on the allegations, conveniently, Diddy was not even in the United States during the time of the raid. According to TMZ, Combs' private jet was spotted on the ground in Antigua, in the Caribbean, shortly after news of the raids broke. Many people believe he is fleeing the country. And today it seems like Diddy is spiraling. He just posted on social media trying to see who in the industry is on his side. Hey, yo, right now though, for real, yo, I need to know who f with me, you know? Like just straight up, like, like I don't have the time. If you f with me, let it be known. If you don't f with me, be quiet. And just in case you wanted some more twisted allegations and insane conspiracy theories, take a look at the founders of Uptown Records, the people who gave Diddy his very first job in the music industry. Andre Harrell, dead at age 59. Heavy D, dead at age 44. Kim Porter, dead at age 47. And Albie Sure, who was just in a coma for two months and almost lost his life. Albie Sure is also the father of Diddy's oldest adopted son. Albie had a child with Kim Porter before she left him, married Diddy, and had children with him. Albie has recently been trying to reach out to his oldest son, hoping that he will leave Diddy and come back home, and when he got out of his coma, he strongly insinuated that Diddy was the reason behind it. We're going to be producing the Albie Shore life story. So hold on to your, hold on to your britches, and you'll really understand how I ended up in a coma. You're really going to need to call Homeland Security. Now why would Diddy want the people who got him into the music industry in the first place to all be dead? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. But it seems like almost everyone around Sean Combs for his whole career either dies, disappears from relevance, or speaks out against his devilish ways. Yet nothing bad ever seems to happen to him. He just seems to get more successful and rich. Is it a coincidence? Maybe. But for now, we will just have to see how this all plays out. Based on everything you have learned in this video, you probably think he is guilty. But as of right now, he is innocent until proven diddy.